So we're going to be in Galatians chapter 2, looking at verses 11 and 14. We're going to be looking at this same passage where the Apostle Paul has a confrontation with uh, the Apostle Peter. The title of the lesson is Open Rebuke. We're going to be primarily looking at verses 11 and 14. Before we get into it, though, I want to go ahead and do some review that in my last Sunday school lesson, we focused on verses 12 and 13, in which we looked at uh, both the background of this isolated event and we looked at the situation itself, which is uh, rather limited in our understanding uh, that this event is, there's not much of a record of this and it's the only record. And then we began by understanding this transitional time when Christians were being uh, shown some important implications of uh, what is the biblical gospel. We saw the result of Peter's recent vision that he had in Acts chapter 10 and the uh, circumstances after that in Acts chapters 10 and 11, in which he was recently instructed by the Lord himself of some important implications of the gospel, that the Jews are no longer required to keep the letter of the Mosaic law, Another one, that unclean animals are now clean and can be eaten. And then consequently also people of other nationalities or locations or societal practices are no longer considered unclean themselves. And then also we saw that a person is now considered unclean only based on whether or not he's in Christ. And that no person should be despised or considered worthy of death if they're considered unclean in any sense of the word. Then we looked at the present situation in which Peter arrived at Antioch and that while he was there, he wouldn't sit with or fellowship with the Gentiles that were there, even though he did before when he was in the Jerusalem church. And then we looked closer at why Paul wisely and biblically judged the situation and determined that Peter was openly sinning. And then we saw that Peter sinned by separating himself from those Gentiles while he was hiding his true reason for doing so, and then leading the other Jews to do so also along with him, which caused him to fail to walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. That was some review to understand the context here. And then today we're going to continue our study of uh, this passage where we're still reviewing Paul's personal record of his uh, qualifications, his apostleship, his conversion, and his associations. And in my last lesson, we looked at the context of this event in verses 11 through 14, but we didn't look at Paul's actions and his words that resulted from Peter's open sins. And so in today's lesson, as we look at verses 11 and 14 particularly, I want us to consider Paul's words here and his actions. So in this lesson, I have five observations I want to make from these two verses alone. Uh, but let's go ahead and read them uh, to get some context here. Starting in verse 9, it says, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. And then I believe shortly after that event, uh, Paul and Barnabas returned to Antioch, and then uh, at the same time or shortly after, Peter uh, left himself to visit the church at Antioch. And then in verse 11, Paul recounts, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he's saying here before Peter came from James, apparently he was sent from James or, or was uh, requested to go by James. He did eat with the Gentiles, that while he was in Jerusalem, he ate with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. 
And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of, Jew, of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Very important question here. So we're going to look at the context around this question. But first I want to look at verse 11. Kind of backtrack a little to verse 11. That we didn't look at this last phrase here in verse 11. He says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I was stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. So we've already gained a good understanding of the problem of Peter's actions. We saw what was meant by his withdrawing and separating himself. We saw what was meant by his dissembling and his uh, dissimulation. And we saw what was meant by his not walking uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. However, the idea of Peter being blamed here provides us some more insight into why Peter deserved Paul's public rebuke. Being blamed here refers to more than just his being at fault. It refers to more than his just being at risk of being blamed for his own sins before God. Peter's being blamed here refers to his being accused by or being determined to be at fault by others for his sinful actions. I believe that Paul writes this because he received word from the others that were questioning Peter's actions at the time. And then as a result of that, Paul rightly determined that Peter was at fault uh, in the eyes of the others and, and in his own eyes, he saw fault there, that he was to be blamed. Peter was not only in a position to be blamed for his own sin of not walking according to the truth of the gospel by separating himself from those Gentiles and for providing a false reason for doing so. What was even worse, though, was that his actions were public and that he was affecting and misleading others. When we draw this conclusion from the text that he was to be blamed by others, it baits the question of whether or not it was right for those others to question Peter's actions, or for Paul to accuse him of the sin of not walking uprightly. And so the spiritually weak Christian or the Christian who wants to hide his sins might think that no one should be judged like this or that no one's sins should be addressed by others. And these spiritually weak or carnal Christians might also argue that it's a person's prerogative to decide whom he wants to fellowship with. It should be my choice of who I want to fellowship with in the church. It should have been Peter's choice. But it's important to point out that there's not necessarily anything wrong with not eating with or with not fellowshipping with others in the church. There's not necessarily anything wrong with one person not fellowshipping with another in the church. However, this needs to be balanced with the need for there to be church unity. The need to prevent schisms and the need to prevent some from having a wrong mentality about the church and to become prejudiced against other members, which I believe was a concern that was going on here in this first century church in Antioch. Church unity in morality and doctrine and in service requires fellowship to occur between all the members. Why? So that they could exhort one another. One of those primary purposes for the fellowship of the church is so that they can exhort one another, so that they can get along with one another, and so that they can serve the Lord together. To do all that, they need unity. And just like in a family, and in the military, and in a sports team, or in a business, nowhere else in life can a group of people who are working or fighting or serving together, 
function well and be productive and, and succeed without having unity, without their getting along with one another, without their working well with one another. Then even further, like what Peter did, there is especially an issue with when someone withdraws himself from or separates himself from others for inappropriate reasons, and then even further when he misrepresents those reasons to those people. And so there are many places in the New Testament where proper church relationships are demanded, where exhortation is commanded, and where unity in the church is required. But there's another important principle that we can observe here, that we all need the accountability of the church. We all need the accountability of the church like Peter received from these other members of the Antioch church. And that accountability is needed even for those who lead, even for those who have authority in the church and for those who rule in the church. Even Peter, a prominent apostle, was not above reproof or correction or rebuke. Paul, as well as these other church members, weren't wrong because they observed or because they questioned or because he rebuked this inappropriate behavior. This accountability, if it's based on the right principles, if it's done for the right reasons, and if it's done the right way, is one of the most important reasons, not only that we need the church, but that we need to be in a biblical church so that it could be done appropriately. We need the accountability of a biblical church. Brings me to my second point. Understanding how Peter was to be blamed, now let's look at the open rebuke. I want us to clarify here that I do believe that this was an open rebuke. In verse 11, it says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. And then verse 14, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? So Peter's actions here, I want to connect them with something else, with another event Peter's actions here remind me of when he denied our Lord during our Lord's trial before the Sanhedrin. Of course, what he did both when he denied our Lord and when he dissembled here from these Gentiles, both events, it was sin. It wasn't just some happenstance wrong decision. It was out of fear. And I don't want to justify what he did on both of those occasions. However, when Peter denied our Lord, I don't believe that he denied our Lord in unbelief. I don't believe that he denied our Lord in a, in a heart of rebellion. And I don't believe that he uh, denied our Lord out of a rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I also don't believe that he lost his salvation, of course. Uh, a person that has true salvation doesn't lose it. As some would say here, uh, because he, quote-unquote, fell away in unbelief and denied the Lord. I believe that Peter committed both of these sins in these two different situations because he did something that was foolish, because he wasn't walking in the Spirit at the moment. In order for him to save face before these people, without considering the gravity of the situations that he was in or the consequences of what he was doing in both situations. And then here at the Antioch church, I don't believe that Peter was being a self-righteous hypocrite, or that he, was, that he thought that he was better than these Gentiles uh, from whom he was separating himself. According to the directions of Matthew 18, verses 15 through 18, it's generally best to address a matter personally, one-to-one, -one, and then if a brother doesn't respond biblically to that concern, then you should address it with him uh, with one or two more witnesses 
And then if he still doesn't respond biblically to that concern, to then bring it before the church. However, Paul writes here that he not only withstood Peter to the face, but he said these words to Peter before all who were there. And there are often times when Christians don't commit egregious or malicious or capital sins. But because they're walking in their flesh, because they make a wrong judgment call about the situation, or they do something foolish, it still results in sin. And Peter maybe didn't think that what he was doing was sin or that it was that serious to warrant an open rebuke from Paul. But we need to remember that sin is deceptive and that sins have greater effects. They have greater consequences than we might think that they will at the time. And as Paul, the apostle, exemplifies here, there are times when a person sins publicly and when that person must be withstood to his face publicly, when he must be withstood before others, and when that person should be compelled, as Peter was here, to give an answer for his actions or his words in front of those with whom he's doing or saying something wrong. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 19 through 20, against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. And obviously we see here, there were many witnesses of what Peter was doing. And then in verse 20 of 1 Timothy chapter 5, them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. I believe this is a great application of this uh, passage here in 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, that we see here someone who sinned publicly, openly, and had to be rebuked before all. And so if a person publicly sins, or if he's, if he's influencing others to sin, or to justify sin, or to contradict their consciences, then that very well might be an appropriate time to publicly address that sin. The purpose, though, is not to make a public example out of that person or to shame that person. The purpose should be to address the public concern that that person is causing. However, this doesn't give the Christian carte blanche to disrespectfully or ungracefully or without meekness go around and call people out for their words and actions, even if he knows that they're sins. Brings me to my third point, which is the question. I want to look more closely at the question that Paul poses to Peter here. In verse 14, But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Jews, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Question mark. Paul points out here that he saw Peter before at the Jerusalem church living after the manner of the Gentiles, living a different way of life. While there in the, in the Jerusalem church, Paul observed that Peter was fellowshipping, was fellowshipping with and eating with Gentiles. And we don't know for sure whether or not Peter himself was eating unclean animals, but he was at least eating with those who were eating unclean animals. And he was told directly by God to kill and to eat unclean animals. And then when he arrived in Antioch, the way that Peter was separating himself from these Gentiles at church was leading those Gentiles there to feel compelled. Notice here that Paul refers to Peter compelling them to live as the Jews. That idea of compelling them is the idea of obligating them to. Uh, to live as do the Jews or according to the Jewish way of life in order for those Gentiles to be accepted by Peter and by the other Jews. They felt that they had to do that. Paul asked Peter here a very simple and clear question. 
that if he's a Jew living like a Gentile before, why is he causing these Gentiles to think that he expects them to live like the Jews? And so Paul here clearly questions Peter's actions, implying that they're being construed as hypocritical. I want us to notice that Paul doesn't accuse Peter of any malicious intentions. Notice he doesn't say anything about Peter's intentions or of whether or not he has sin in his heart. Notice that he only addresses his actions. He only addresses the effect that his actions were having on others. I want us to notice that all that Paul did in public was ask him a question. He did not directly accuse Peter of sin. The way that Paul phrases this question, some might think that it was a rhetorical question. It might have been. It's hard to tell whether or not it was a rhetorical question. However, although I would call this an open rebuke, I personally think that Paul was only asking a loaded question that called for an explanation, that called for an apology. And although this was an open rebuke, if we examine it closely, we find that it was actually a very tactfully phrased and respectful question, which afforded Peter an opportunity to respond. And so I believe that Paul here intentionally left the conversation open-ended. And due to the way that Paul asked this question, Peter could have responded. Peter could have simply responded by saying, that's a great question, Paul. I was looking for an opportunity to tell everyone about this vision that I recently had. And I was looking for an opportunity to do so. Or he could have apologized and said, yes, I understand my actions of late, but I want to let you know that I learned something regarding our relationships uh, from this vision that I had recently. Paul left it open-ended, intentionally, I believe, for the Apostle Peter to be able to respond. So when others sin, their sins do need to be addressed. We do need to also, though, be careful not to be too quick and to wrongly accuse that person of sin, especially publicly. And this is why we need to follow Matthew 18's instructions for addressing the sins of others, which begin with a private conversation, a private discussion. Unfortunately, I've seen that people can be too quick to define wrong actions or wrong statements or wrong behavior as sin, which in the, that situation could have possibly been avoided by instead asking a public question or by publicly requesting an explanation. And so, of course, there, are, there also needs to be a balance on the other side of this matter, uh, that there are some who knowingly allow others to commit egregious or open sins without ever having the boldness to address the sins, which is also sinful. Not that they should be addressed wrongly or that they should not be addressed. They just need to be addressed properly. So like Paul, when a situation calls for such discussions, we need to have a biblical foundation to determine what the sin is. We need to make sure that our questions or corrections of others are being spirit-led and done tactfully. And we need to make sure that we have a meek attitude and we need to have the intention of reconciliation when such situations arise. Brings me to my fourth point. I want to briefly look at the outcome, the outcome of the situation. We don't know what the outcome of the situation was. There's no record here of how Peter reacted to Paul's open rebuke. I personally would like to assume that Peter humbly and wisely and gracefully and thankfully received Paul's rebuke. And we need to remember that a person's wisdom, his love for the truth, and his spiritual understanding 
is not measured by his ability to live without correction. Instead, his wisdom and his love for the truth and his spiritual understanding is measured by his response to correction. Proverbs chapter 9, verses 8 through 9, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Notice the response. That there are times when a wise man needs to be rebuked. And when he is, you determine his wisdom by his response to the rebuke, that he will love you for it. And then it says in verse 9 of Proverbs chapter 9, Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. And so correction and instruction and reproof and rebuke should not have to be done perfectly for us to receive it. A person shouldn't have to be apologetic. He shouldn't have to talk softly. He shouldn't have to be fearful of recourse when he discusses a possible sin with the Christian. He shouldn't have to have the right attitude. He shouldn't have to have the right volume. He shouldn't have to do it at the appropriate time. And he shouldn't have to be a person from whom that Christian should want to receive correction. We must always be ready and willing to hear any, re any rebuke from anyone at any time and in any place, even if somebody does it openly. So when the Christian is given correction or rebuke, the first thing that he should do is receive the instruction, receive the correction, receive the rebuke. If he is wrong in any way, he should own up to his sin, and he should show brokenness and sorrow and repentance for that sin. However, there's another important aspect that we, I want to mention here, that if a person is in sin, if the other person is addressing the sin wrongfully, or if that other person is being hypocritical while he's addressing the sin, or if that other person had malicious intent in his, in his rebuke, it should be addressed at another time, not then and there. We don't need to become defensive and turn it around onto the other person. When, a, when someone else rebukes him, at the time of that rebuke, that Christian should not retract from or deflect or marginalize or try to justify the problem or the sin that he has. Any refusal to receive rebuke shows others that person's pride. It shows that person's stubbornness. It shows that person's weakness. It shows that person's immaturity. And it shows that person's foolishness if he in any way does not receive rebuke when it's needed. So if the other person is wrongfully accusing the Christian, for instance, if the person is receiving rebuke or correction and the other person that's providing it is wrong, then it's best for that Christian to diffuse the situation and ask to speak about it privately. Or the Christian should ask questions for clarity before he considers how he should respond to that open rebuke or to that question of his integrity or of the sin that he might have committed. My last point is the reasons. I want to review multiple reasons in brief that Paul mentions this situation. First, I want to say that one of those reasons is not because Paul was trying to exalt himself. One of those reasons that he brings this up is not so that he can discredit Peter. If Paul didn't have important reasons for bringing up this whole situation here, I believe that Paul would have lovingly covered the sin of his brother. That love covers a multitude of sins. Paul makes it clear here that he was bringing up the situation for the benefit of the gospel. The whole point of every situation that he's bringing up here in Galatians chapter 1 and 2 is for the benefit of the gospel. And he recounts this situation to prove that those in the Jerusalem church and those in the Antioch church 
all understood the implications of the gospel. They understood what it meant to walk uprightly according to the gospel, according to the truth of the gospel. And so Paul brought this up to make sure that these Galatians who are reading this epistle also understood the, that the gospel places both Jews and Greeks on equal footing. And it teaches that the Jews don't have to live according to the letter of the Mosaic law. And it teaches that the Gentiles don't have to live as do the Jews. Another purpose of this being recorded was to prove to these Gentiles and to the Judaizers in their midst that the other apostles were also fallible and that Paul was an equal to Peter, which was proven by his ability to rebuke Peter publicly. Another purpose was to prove that these Galatians, uh, to prove to these Galatians that Paul had been preaching the same gospel since the beginning. His gospel never changed. His gospel was the same when, it, when he was serving the Lord before he ever met the apostles. From that day that he met the Lord on the road to Damascus, it was the same during his first visit to Jerusalem when he preached the gospel in Jerusalem in the outlying area in Judea. It was the same during his second visit to Jerusalem when he and the other apostles acknowledged their agreement. And it was the same during his time at Antioch right before he was sent on his mission to visit the Galatians. Our doctrine will change. Our doctrine will develop as we receive the truth and we're shown more truth. However, the gospel never changes. Our gospel should never also change that we preach to others. Finally, one last reason for this event to be recorded is for us to remember that there are more implications to the gospel than just salvation from sins. And that we must continue to walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. It affects all areas of our lives, not just salvation from sins. It even affects our fellowship in the church. That was the lesson today. In closing, we saw the need of the accountability of other members of the church to make our sins known to us so that we can walk in the truth, in the truth ourselves. And then we saw the reasoning behind Paul's public question to Peter and why his open rebuke was both appropriate and tactfully done. And then we saw that although we don't see Peter's response here, it's important for us to humbly and wisely receive the correction and rebuke of others. Whether or not they deserve to give it to us, whether or not the situation is right, we need to be willing to receive uh, instruction, correction, and re rebuke. Uh, that was the lesson today. Pastor, anything to add? Any comments or questions?